Thanks, Michael. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I'm going to just give you a little preview of my talks this week. Today we're going to talk about the technique, the practical element of how to do this. I'm going to focus both on artistry as well as technique, so I think both are very important. The book I wrote a few years ago is more sort of a cookbook of how to do it, and I want to sort of go through some of my philosophical thinking of how to strategize each face that I approach. Later this week, on Saturday, I'll be giving a talk more about sort of my philosophical ideas about safety, long-term safety, understanding good candidates, um, how to choose a patient, things like that. It'll be a much shorter talk. And then on Sunday, there'll be a, a, a replay of the video. Half of this talk is going to be video, and half of it will be slides. I th Brian, I think you can advance it for me. Go ahead and advance it. All right, so. You've seen the slide before I presented. The idea here is who is a good candidate and, and what happens with aging? If you look at Sharon Stone over that 20 years, the initial temptation is to look at that brow and say, well, it's, it's totic. And you look at that eyelid, you say it's hanging. You look at the cheek, it's hanging. The jawline is hanging. But the question really, is that the case? If you look at her, look at the brows very carefully. The right side, it's about the same. The left side is about the same. And if you look at the eyelid skin, there's, it's a little lower on the right but it's a little higher on the left, actually. So there is very little gravity. And so when we start to think of everything as gravitational, we, I think we break down and we try to lift everything. I think you, it's, there's no doubt this is clearly a volumetric issue. And so it's, it's very important that we think that way. Next slide. So a paradigm shift, understanding. We heard a paradigm shift earlier from Nabil. I want, to hear, I want you guys to think this differently. This is a way of communicating to your patients. First of all, when we're young, we're full. There's almost sometimes too much fullness. And I use the analogy of a grape. As we get older, we become raisins. It deflates. It's, it shrinks down. And so the question is, if you pull and stretch that, that raisin, you're going to make a pea, not, next slide, a grape. So this is a different way of thinking it. And this, it's always about patient communication, having them understand how to think differently, just as much as it's important for you to understand how to think differently. Next slide. So is this the answer? We hear this, this term bandied about, which is the pillow face in, in, in Hollywood, making really large faces. You see people that were overlifted at one point, now overfilled. Is that, the, is that the right way to go? Next slide. The answer is no, obviously. So the question is, how do we conceptualize aging? Well, the idea is that when we're young, we're almost too full, right? Think of a one-year-old. Now think of a 10-year-old. Now think of a 20-year-old. And as we continue down that slide, we just continue to lose volume, minus obviously weight gain that may occur with metabolic slowdown as we, as we mature. So what we oftentimes we find when I speak with women, who's the majority of my patients, is that they don't want necessarily a 20-year-old face when they're actually too full. Because I define baby fat as not some esoteric fat, but it's fat as any point before an ideal. And hollowness is any point after that ideal. So it's just a linear loss of fat from birth to death. Death. Next slide, please. So here is a way that when we see a face 20 feet away, don't we understand that person's aging before we see gravity and wrinkles and all those things that we attribute to aging? Yes. It's an instantaneous. I know how this old this person is in a, within a rough decade. And that's because of how, uh, how the highlights and shadows occur on the face and general facial morphology. So when we look at 20-year-olds, they're very full and round, no matter how thin their body uh, composition is. At 30, there's a start leading in, and most women prefer their face at 30 or 32. As we go into 35, there's more of a sculpting. As we get into 40, what happens is sometimes there's a squaring off when the malar eminence starts to become more prominent, and there's a little bit of pre sulcus that starts to dip. We get maybe some metabolic slowdown, some weight gain. Weight gain. The 50s start to dominate in the lower face. There's a inverse triangulation of the face. And as we get much, more, uh, much older, we start to truly lose volume around the eyes, and then we start to get an inverted triangle appearance. So the trick here is to look at 30 as an ideal in that hybrid shape. Next slide is really more of an oval. Next slide. And you can see that that's really the focal point. And I'm going to sort of focus on that. So a lot of times when you see before and afters on fat graphs, there are three-quarter images. I'm going to focus on frontal views because that's how we relate to each other socially. And that's how I present my before and afters. Next slide. So cheeks. That's something that obviously all of you are very focused on. It's the easiest thing to do. We think this is where fat grafting is. I had a patient just last week I did a fat transfer on, and she brought this uh, photograph of Suzanne Summers in here. And she had these massively large cheeks. They looked ridiculous, right? All I did to show her that it actually looked good was I covered the bottom half of her face. 
all of, a sudden, all of a sudden she looked good because the face wasn't balanced. Today we're going to talk about facial balancing. So if you're just sticking fat in the cheeks, sometimes you're making a face look worse because the face is not matched. So when we age, we don't just age in the cheek, we age everywhere. And I'm going to sort of walk you through the, the esoteric elements of going through strategy-wise how to build a face from scratch. So the cheek is divided for me into two areas. There's an anterior cheek and there's a lateral cheek. The anterior cheek is much more the dominant element for, for women where you start to lose that. And so this is an area that's that malar ligament, that, that sort of diagonal line that falls in front of the malar eminence. And, the, the, and the, the lateral cheek I define is just the area that's over the sort of the malar eminence on the side. And so when you divide it that way, you can start to define how much am I going to put into the cheek, cheek, lateral cheek. And in the video, I think you're going to hear sort of, you know, what numbers am I using, how am I putting it in. Next slide. The buckle is so critical, especially for someone starting to get gaunt. And this is what is that transition, uh, able to create a highlight and to blend the cheek down into the lower face. If you just build the cheek up, you just get this cheeky chipmunky look that looks ridiculous. And so the buckle zone is very important. We're going to start subdividing the buckle area um, more in detail. And this is one of the things that I think I've contributed to the literature is understanding how to, to conceptualize the buckle area for fat transfer. Next slide. The chin. So we do chin implants for aging face. Is that good? In my opinion, it's not because there's more bony show. Same with cheek implants. If you accentuate cheek, uh, bone transitions and bony highlights, you're actually aging the face. Where the aging is on the chin is higher up. You've got to look higher. It's not the mental sulcus per se. It's not a linear deficit. It's the exposure of bone around the chin right here. I call it the upside down U. Or we're going to explore that more in detail. It starts from the pregial sulcus, arches up toward the midline, and then comes back down in a, in a gentle slope. So next slide. So when you do this, you create ovals. And ovalization is beautiful. Sometimes you slim the face, you'll see this. Sometimes you widen the face. And, and that's the artistry that I want to emphasize. Next slide. So 48, 50. You can see this is an upper blepharoplasty, some laser plasma treatments, Botox, and fat graft. One session. No touch-ups. And you can see that you can get really amazing results if you do it in a beautiful fashion, in a really balanced way. No facelift. Next slide. Buckle. Let's get into the buckle. Next slide. The central buckle area is basically, next slide, Brian, is the central area right here. And that's an area that everyone knows, right? It's obvious, right? In the central area where it's sort of when you suck in your cheeks. Next slide. But there's also the area right below the bone. And so when you're seeing someone from a frontal view and you see that bone dip going inward, it's an area that if you fill that little area and you transition it, you don't see the bone dip coming down. It's an area that I focus on. It's a backfill zone. It's a subzygomatic, whatever you want to call it. It's sort of a lateral portion of the buccal area. And I sub mentally subdivide that. And I visually subdivide it. You'll see a preoperative video that I do. that will help you understand that. Next slide. And then as we get much older, you can really start losing volume into the, what I call the medial buccal hollow, which is really where the dentition starts to lose. And you start to see that. And sometimes you build up the buccal and the cheek area. You'll start to see this deficit start, start to go in as well. And you want to blend that in. Next slide. So here's an example of a lady, fat graft, a year and a half out, one session, uh, very spotty Botox, so really nothing else. And what you're seeing in her is a subzygomatic central buccal, uh, not really much medial buccal hollow, but just sort of lateral central, it's anterior cheek, outer cheek, brow, anterior chin, and all those components really create, I think, a, a very nice balance to her face. And she had already a facelift, but trying to get some volume, but it, it didn't do what she wanted to do because she's volume deprived. Next slide. This is a lady I did upper blepharoplasty, lower blepharoplasty, some plasma resurfacing, Botox, but fat grafting is in essence about a year and a half out. What you're seeing here, and this, she had one touch up. You can see that it's a really a volume balancing issue. Um, what I've done for her is I did very little in the central buckle so that it, she didn't get her face widened. I wanted to actually sort of narrow her face. So it's a visual illusion. When you work in the buckle area, it can work really well for transitions, but it can also over accentuate and widen a face. So this is part of the judgment that goes into when you see a face of how to determine how to make it look better. Next slide. This face, as you see, is actually very wide. And so what, you're, what I'm doing here is really focusing on central cheek, nothing lateral cheek, nothing lateral buccal, uh, buccal area or lateral mandible. Everything is central chin, central cheek, and it draws your face to create an optical illusion of being narrower. Um, next slide. So let's talk about the eye. I think it's the most important thing, if you can get out of this, this lecture, is understanding how to frame the eye. Because we're so used to blepharectomies and removing tissues that if we start to see as a, as a model of deflation, you'll see that, for me, it's 
lower bluffs are one out of 20 cases. I'll, I'll do it in conjunction with fat grafting. And upper bluffs, probably one in 10. It's very unlikely I'll need to do it. And brow lifts, I, I've done one in the last three years in someone with a congenitally low brow. It's just not that necessary when you start to see the face differently. Next slide. So we're going to talk about this case again. Next slide. Um, sorry, we're going to talk about this case. This, if you look at this, this is, if you look at her eyes, very wide set. And by filling it in, it really creates a really, really nice blending look. Instead of actually lifting anything, you just fill it in, where it doesn't look like that she needs that initially. Next slide. This is the same case you see here. This is taking a little bit of tissue out and then adding it back in. Next slide. And this, this is a case where the lady already had a brow lift and eyelid procedure at 41, and she just has more hollowness. So this is just putting the fat back in and showing that change that's there. That's also a year and a half out. Next slide. So let's talk about the eye frame more specifically in detail. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. It's not as elegant when I don't have the clicker here. Uh, so the, um, tier, the, the inner aspect of the orbital rim, I divide, into, I divide the orbital rim into two major areas, inner, next, and outer, and then next, and the little nasal jugal groove going medially. And we're going to talk about each of these components as we go through it more in detail. Next slide. The lateral canthus. Next slide. A beautiful brow highlight, which is something that if you start to really see it in that highlight reflex that goes right across the lateral brow, you'll start to be, I think, really excited to see that. Next slide. The A-frame deformity, which is really the area where either they've had a blepharectomy or they've just had a bite. And then really understanding through that transition where the orbital rim dips in, where you see that little bone edge dip in. That's where I really focus my fat so you don't see that. Next slide. And then the thing I've been adapting the last two years is just saying, well, if all that looks good, is there a little area that I could improve a, a bit? And that's going to be right in this area. So I just blend that little area in. Uh, next slide. So we're, these are the markings I usually do to start. Let's do a little video. Next slide. Hope the audio works. <laughs> 